Good. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last of the events uh, on Earth observation during the GI Forum 2020. It is my very pleasure to announce today's keynote that is going to be given by Mrs. Angel Millareza. Anne is founder and CEO of Radiant Earth Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that looks into offering organizations the means to tackle the UN Spatial Development Goals. Um, but she will tell us about more in her talk. What I would like to um, emphasize about Anne is that in her decade long, uh, decades long uh, experience, she built uh, knowledge and uh, important know-how in remote sensing and industry management. And if I may say so, made data her business. She started off or one of the early remote sensing um, experiences that included um, management as well was at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric um, Administration, where she directed uh, remote sensing and GS programs. Uh, today, uh, and oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so we now have um, our second chair. Welcome, Lawrence. Uh, today, Anne is um, involved with um, many different boards where she um, brings her expertise uh, into the, the business life of these institutions, such as um, National Geospatial Advisory Committee, such as um, NOAA Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing, as well as Landsat Advisory Group. So, and I would like you to tell us more about the uh, topic that you have prepared for us, which is innovation in geospatial analytics for land, sea, and space. Very keen to hear what you have to say about data and technology that is at the center of your organization. Welcome, and the stage is yours. Great, thank you, Adriana. Uh, let's see if I can Get it up. Aha, can you see my screen? Yes, I, we can. Okay, Thank you. perfect. Uh, good morning, I guess good afternoon uh, to each of you. I'm uh, speaking to you from uh, the state of South Carolina, kind of close to Charleston, South Carolina um, on the coast. Um, I must say I have easily given, you know, 75 keynotes in my uh, 35 plus professional career, but I've never done it remotely. Um, and actually I love and embrace the opportunity to do keynote addresses because I get to look people in the eye and that's what gives me energy. And so right now I'm sitting in a little conference room all by myself. <laughs> I, really, I really wish that I could be there in person with all of you, but given the pandemic, obviously that's not possible. And given the fact that I'm a US citizen, you wouldn't let me in anyway, and I frankly don't blame you. <laughs> um, so with that, I want to talk uh, today about, really at the end of the day, it's about the innovation that we're seeing in the geospatial sciences. And um, I know many of you are university students or recent graduates, and I, I think the thesis of my presentation um, is that the future is yours. Uh, the greatest amount of innovation that's going to occur in this field, I believe, is going to occur in the next five to ten years. And um, I hope you embrace that. So the outline uh, for my talk, it's great to be here. Um, I want to go spend a little bit of time on what is Ready in Earth Foundation, just a couple of slides so you know what we do and how hopefully we can be of service to you as uh, in your future. Talk about the new sensors, new hardware, new processing methods, and then talk about some of the old problems that have gone away, some of the old problems that still persist, and the new problems, uh, along with some conclusions about what I see happening in the future. 
So first to tell you about Radiant Earth, um, I founded Radiant Earth almost exactly four years ago this week uh, with the mission of empowering organizations and individuals globally with open AI and machine learning and earth observation data, standards and tools to address the world's most critical international development ch uh, challenges, as Adriana said, um, and the sustainable development goals. Our vision is a strengthened global development community that benefits from high quality and trusted AI and machine learning earth observation resources for positive global impact. You can really kind of bend our activities into three program areas. Radiant ML Hub, and I encourage all of you to go there if you're interested in machine learning and you would like to find some training data sets. Uh, was launched in December of 2019. Uh, we are rapidly populating that ML Hub with data sets. We recently posted and registered to it the Big EarthNet data set um, of Europe. Uh, we hope to begin building an infrastructure in the next couple of months to also host open ML models and to be able to uh, encourage the community to build those models and improve on those models and share them back as well. We do high impact competitions. We recently sponsored a competition of computer vision for small leaseholder agriculture in a couple of African countries. We had right around 700 participants in that competition. And interestingly, uh, the top seven uh, winners of that competition were all from the African continent, which is exactly what we wanna see. We also spend a lot of time talking about best practices and developing best practices for image annotation and ground reference data. We uh, are looking to build the community of machine learning on Earth observations, and particularly around open data. Uh, we are developing standards for interoperability for data sets. Perhaps the one you are familiar with is the standard spatial temporal asset catalog stack. Um, we convene technical working groups and write white papers. And then finally, our education and outreach. I encourage you to register for our newsletter. A Radiant, uh, a Radiant Earth Foundation newsletter, you can register on our website. Um, again, data competitions, speaking about best practices and um, speaking engagements like this. So that just gives you a background of what I'm doing now, but really what I'd like to turn to next is the future and, and talking about the future from the lens of my past. Um, I got out of graduate school in 1984, started my first job January 4th, 1985. Um, that was a lifetime ago. <laughs> uh, and at that time, Landsat was the only satellite on orbit that was available for civilian use. Um, things have changed dramatically as this slide shows. Um, this slide has not been updated. I gave up trying to update this slide, particularly on the launch information. Um, I am sure that the number of Earth observation satellites in orbit right now far exceeds 700. Uh, but I think the graphic itself um, portrays the message that I wanna leave with you. And that is there is an explosion of data available from satellites, not to mention from drones. I remember the first time I saw a drone uh, was in 2005. I used to run an airborne mapping company and I was at an industry forum and uh, someone had brought in the first prototype of a drone and I was just fascinated by it. Um, as a CEO of an airborne mapping company, uh, all I could see were cost savings. <laughs> I was still pretty skeptical, skeptical about the quality of the data that could come off of such a small sensor, but clearly I was wrong. Um, and so we see a dramatic increase in imagery supply and data supply from drones as well. And then finally, sensors um, and the improvement and the fidelity of data that you can get from aircraft sensors. So the world is awash in, in data. What 
we could never have processed that amount of data previously before cloud computing. When I had my first management job, uh, I was running a large uh, research and development project to map a watershed in the US. And it was in 1989, I bought my first gigabyte of data. That gigabyte cost $25,000, just one gigabyte. Um, now, I mean, much of Radiant Earth Foundation, uh, we push around a lot of data and our annual cloud bill is less than $25,000. So you take this, this um, explosion of high quality earth observation data, intersect that with cloud computing, making it easier, easier to view and analyze, and then integrate it with machine learning and the opportunity I believe to create new solutions is just dramatic. You intersect that with the data that we'll be getting from the Internet of Things, uh, potentially with the integration of blockchain. I, I really believe that we're going to see rapid innovation in the geospatial sciences. And in the not too distant future, maybe three, maybe five years, a digital twin of the Earth at least every week, if not every day. So as I said, how's this possible? Um, this to this slide has not been updated since 2017. I'm sure uh, the access there and the rate of growth has gone up dramatically. In 2017, there were 210 satellites launched. I'm sure that's north of 300 in 2020 and 2019. Um, but launch has gone up dramatically. What's made that possible? And the price of launch is still very expensive. Um, prices are coming down, but per kilogram, uh, launch is very expensive. What is driving the ability uh, here is the fact that the size of the satellites are getting much smaller and they weigh far less. Um, so this is driving much of the uh, much of the growth in the marketplace. Um, then we look at the temporal resolution. Um, back in the day when I started with Landsat, we got a Landsat scene was taken. <laughs> it was imaged about every 18 days, uh, but it took well over six months to get your hands on the data, if you were lucky. Um, we can see that has changed dramatically. I think the best example now is Planet. Uh, Planet images the Earth every day with uh, one of the satellites in their constellation. Speaking though of planet, this is still a dangerous game. It's still a difficult business. It's still a very risky business. Uh, planet lost, I believe, five satellites uh, three to four days ago with the unsuccessful launch of Rocket Labs. Um, and there were several other satellites on that launch as well. So the amount of data we're getting is dramatically increasing the fidelity of that data is increasing, the temporal resolution of that data is increasing, and it opens up a tremendous number of new opportunities. The interesting thing here from a market perspective is this is being, much of this innovation is entirely driven by the commercial sector. I would have said five, six, seven years ago, the US-based commercial uh, market. Uh, that is no longer true, as you'll see in my uh, observations at the end. Uh, this is a global phenomena. We're seeing tremendous amount of investment from all over the globe. Uh, we updated this slide in November of 2019. I'm sure we'll update it again in another six months or so. But you, you know, think again. It was back in you know 1992. There would have been there would not have been a single company in this space. And most of this innovation has occurred, uh, most of these companies, with the exception of Airbus and Maxar Digital Globe, have been born in the last eight to 10 years. We also seem, see the same um, commercial investment in radar satellites, something that I am very interested in the future of radar and the ability to merge radar with electro-optical uh, data, particularly in the global development community uh, where cloud cover is uh, a really significant issue. Being able to merge uh, those two signals um, to uh, 
infer what's happening on the surface of the earth. Um, so there's dramatic uh, innovation and investment there. And now also in the commercial weather satellite space. Um, until very recently, there were no commercial satellites. And in fact, the first um, contract announcement for a major uh, government agency to buy data from one of these companies occurred two weeks ago. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the US National Weather Service, has announced that they will now be accepting commercial weather satellites data to feed into their global weather models. I'm sure ECMWF, UK Met, and many of the others will be close behind. So now let's talk about some of the really innovative things that are being done uh, with these new sensors. This is a drone image. This work is being done at Duke University and actually running photogrammetric measurements off of whale populations. There was another slide that I wanted to put in here, but it was uh, the only thing I could find was a video. And I didn't want to risk running a video through this, uh, uh, through this system, uh, is a system that has been developed in Australia to, through drone imagery, automatically identify sharks off the beaches of Australia and do machine learning on the drone to determine the species and the size of the shark, to determine whether or not it's likely to be dangerous, and if so, to clear the beaches immediately. It's just fascinating uh, what's happening. And my, and my original studies were in marine science and marine biology. And so I, I naturally um, um, uh, am led towards talking about these marine applications. Another marine application is a company actually that I'm on the board of science advisors for, which is called SailDrone. SailDrone is an autonomous vessel. You see um, two of them here that can go out to sea for a year at a time and measure many, many different uh, parameters at sea. They, they, this vessel is 23 feet long. Um, Sail drone is now manufacturing one that is 72 feet long. It's solar powered and wind powered. It has a satellite uh, link for live data feeds. And again, it can go out for a year at a time. Um, it, is measuring a whole host of, these are the standard instruments that are on a sail drone, um, atmospheric measurements that get fed into uh, national weather models, physical measurements on wave height, magnetic field, depth. Um, and in fact, that depth parameter was the reason to, add, uh, to build a 72 foot sail drone to actually do accurate bathymetry. Uh, which is a very expensive endeavor, and ocean measurements, um, including measuring uh, fish biomass and doing um, artificial intelligence on what fishes it's seeing and the size of those fishes. So think about one of these ships, and hundreds of these are being manufactured, and Sail Drone has a lot of good competitors. These vessels are going to patrol our oceans in the next five to seven years. And we'll finally have accurate data at um, a regular rate on 80% of the surface of the earth. So let's intersect machine learning with these earth observations. And I wanna just give you a few uh, quick examples. Um, I believe this is a typical technology adoption cycle. I believe we are at the very beginning of this slide at the very beginning of the early adopters. And I would encourage all of you to join in to shape this field as it goes forward. Um, what we need for machine learning primarily are training data. Uh, that's the first and foremost thing we need. And then from there, building good models. In our work at the Radiant Earth Foundation, we have found that there is a scarce scarcity of data, particularly in the global South that data it lacks any geodiversity. Um, the accessibility of that data is very difficult to get your hands on. The interoperability and the machine learning readiness is, is difficult. So there are big, big gaps in training data ca catalogs, which um, lead to biased or incorrect results. 
Um, and so that's one of the reasons that's one of the reasons we're focused on um, building Radiant ML Hub as a library for these. What can we expect once we have a robust community? We can expect uh, better models. They're built more quickly and efficiently to be able to analyze the, the waterfall of data that we're getting from the sensors that I talked about earlier. The products will be more accurate and less expensive, lower cost, less duplication, less technical friction, higher quality data, and most importantly, better solutions to solve society's uh, problems and the sustainable development goals. Uh, one example here, I have a good friend who works at Oak Ridge National Labs here in the US. Um, he has the great advantage of having the world's fastest computer, or it was six months ago, the Chinese may now have a new one, where um, because he had accurate tra training data, he was able to identify every building greater than 10 meters in the state of South Carolina to automatically detect it and to create polygon boundaries in less than 24 hours. He went on to do the same for much of the US, um, and this was driven by a very active hurricane season here in the US. This is a similar example um, where Digital Globe, now known as Maxar Technologies, was working at the direction of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation has invested heavily in doing building identification, primarily for their global health programs. Um, in order for them to route malaria and polio vaccine, they need to know how much vaccine they need and where the people are that need the vaccine and what roads they take uh, to get that vaccine in, into those communities. And there is a tremendous lack of spatial data infrastructure for much of Africa. And so the Gates Foundation has invested heavily in doing this work. And now all the buildings in Africa have been built and are available for use for nonprofit and government use. This is some work that Radiant did again for the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and is directly applicable to a sustainable development goal, uh, goal number six. Um, and this is a uh, waste treatment facility. Um, the, the foundation pays to operate this facility um, and the operators are private operators, private companies. Uh, and we set up a system using Sentinel, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, um, and some machine learning uh, methodologies to monitor how much waste was being processed in that facility um, against what the operator was saying was processed and how much the Gates Foundation was paying for it. The uh, last example I want to share with you is that of uh, some fascinating done work done by the World Bank. This is an image in Mexico. Uh, it's a drone image. The thesis here is that the World Bank wanted to use uh, ground-based imagery and drone imagery, fuse those two together, uh, develop machine learning algorithms, and to be able to identify buildings that were at risk in times of earthquakes. Um, this is a major program, uh, safe housing for the World Bank, uh, and they spend millions and millions of dollars doing this manually now by going and physically inspecting each of these buildings. Uh, and so they were looking to see if they could use uh, street view imagery and drone imagery to predict soft story uh, buildings that were hazards. Um, you can see some of the analysis here. The final story is of the 560 structures identified by engineers as being soft story in the first run of this model, uh, the model identified 89%. So you can see with some increased uh, training data and slightly in enhancing the models through time, this will dramatically save the World Bank money money which they can put into retrofitting these structures to make them safer in earthquake prone areas. So those are just a few examples. Wrapping up here, I wanna talk about some old problems that persist and new problems that emerge. Connectivity, in the part of the world that Radiant Earth Foundation is focused on, connectivity is still a problem. 
Uh, we do have a number of large industry players like OneWeb, like Facebook, and many others that are looking to provide internet from space. Um, we still haven't seen those price points come down enough to where it's truly going to be available uh, for much of the world, for 3 billion people who are not connected now. Um, but I, I believe we'll solve that problem, but it, it is persistent. The one that probably I should expect, but still frustrates me is collaboration and data sharing from an institutional perspective, not a technical perspective. It used to be that technically it was difficult to share data, as difficult as it was institutionally. I recently posted a blog just last week about this issue. Um, so I encourage you to uh, reach out and uh, check that out on the Radiant Earth Foundation a website. Um, capacity development, although I'm starting, we're starting to see uh, real significant inroads there. As I mentioned, we uh, hosted a machine learning competition in Africa uh, back in April. It was interesting to note that within the country of Nigeria, there are, are over 1 million data scientists uh, in a collective club there. So we're seeing that capacity increase dramatically. I think we still have the problem of, as technologists, we talk about the technology more than we talk about the solution and why we run these applications. And I think that continues to lead to funding issues. Uh, but that is getting better. With that said, I think there are new problems emerging. Uh, privacy and ethics and geolocation and machine learning is a big problem. And I can say unequivocally that the geospatial community until very recently has stuck their head in the sand and said, nah, not really our problem. It is our problem. And we as a community need to embrace it, work with uh, the legal and regulatory frameworks be at the policy tables and have be a part of those conversations. Uh, training data standards and access, uh, the whole reason we created Radiant Earth Foundation is a problem. The adoption of many of these new standards, COG, STAC, and ARD, we need to encourage that. We need more research on machine learning accuracy assessment. And frankly, it's just hard to stay abreast of the changing landscape from a technical and a market perspective. So in conclusion, um, and I usually start a talk like this um, and mention it at the very beginning, I have never been more positive uh, about the future of geospatial sciences and the innovation that we can bring to our communities and to our countries and to the globe and to climate change. This is a global phenomenon with markets across the globe responding. I think also it's wonderful to see how rapidly the profession is diversifying. As you can imagine, when I got out of graduate school 35 years ago, there were very, very, very few women in this field um, and even fewer minorities. Um, and I'm seeing that change dramatically. I wanna underscore again, I believe there's serious issues of privacy and ethics that we cannot ignore. They will not go away. They will be a problem and they are a threat. Um, I see where commercial data suppliers are rapidly changing their business models and moving from selling data to selling services off their platforms, which I think is a great thing. I think it will have some interesting consequences for those who prefer to do their own work, but we'll see. And then finally, um, and I've, had, I've said this in public before, I said it in front of a large US-based conference of mostly government people about nine months ago, I believe the European Union is now leading the way for supplying and supporting open data innovation, particularly around the Copernicus program. Um, and I think that's wonderful. I think uh, I am encouraging the United States government to augment its policy and some of its funding programs to, to, uh, to step back into the arena with the European Union but I do believe the European Union is leading right now. So with that, um, this is, you know, these are my coordinates. We'd love to hear from you. Please uh, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our um, newsletter, uh, share your training data, or also come in and find training data for your projects uh, at Radiant ML Hub. So thank you.
I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Yeah. So I will take over for the moment. My name is Lawrence. Yeah. I'm sorry I was a little later because um, we were just opening um, a new project. It was the, the opening ceremony of a new project that we have in cooperation with MSF, Doctors Without Borders. So which is exactly oh, about remote sensing applications for um, humanitarian action, right? Sure. So in this context, really, this is this is like addressing exactly similar topics. So I'm I'm really excited to pick your brain maybe in, in super detail later or on another day. Um, but I, I have a really a number of questions. One is you mentioned blockchain. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, to me, it's a, a magical thing that I only hear with fancy things like like cryptocurrency. Um, but what is the the application that that could be done for in in EO and GIS? Well, that that's interesting. I think there is a place for blockchain in an EO marketplace, and perhaps one that is for commercial data providers. Uh, there's actually a European company, I believe it's called EO Cloud, um, that is uh, investigating the use of blockchain. Radiant investigated the use of blockchain um, a couple of years ago where we were hosting commercial data that was licensed on our platform, but that license allowed us to share it with nonprofit organizations, specific nonprofit organizations, but not for commercial purposes. And we use the chain itself, I'm not, cryptocurrency doesn't interest me, as the truth machine, right, of who's really a registered nonprofit um, and who really has access to this data, what data they were accessing and what they were doing with it as a way to feed information back to the commercial suppliers that in fact we were respecting their license um, and their data was getting used for certain purposes. But I, um, I would encourage you to look at EO Cloud. I believe that they have a much larger vision um, of creating a geospatial marketplace and have, um, I believe, their own cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Adriana, we still can't hear you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> continue. I continue. I'm I'm looking at this at the chat right now to see what uh, gentleman Julian Bruns uh, was writing. Uh, he said, maybe you can see it as well. Uh, you said that the job of the machine learning field is to provide training and test data, but is it, is this not the job of the field where MS, ML is applied to? It is not the job of machine develop the foundations, methods, algorithms, and broad evaluation matrix. In my opinion, the fields can then apply those methods like DNN and modify them to the data and special requirements for the analysis. So basically, he says it should be the user, the end user, so to say, who should come to us and, and bring the data, the training data. Um, yeah. What's yeah, so I, I think the best analogy there is we're building libraries. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it goes back to an early um, saying about building national spatial data infrastructure and global spatial data infrastructure. Collect once, use many. Right. And if we have built the standards, particularly around ground reference data, mm -hmm. how to collect ground reference data, um, the quality issues there why aren't we using it multiple times and why aren't we allowing people why are we spending so much time collecting ground reference data for one problem when it can be used to solve many many problems if it's high quality and if it has good metadata um so and i think okay. the field will be wide open i think there are lots of data scientists who want to work on this data who um who aren't going to get a lot of project funding to go collect their own data. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm trying again. Oh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm back. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, 
may I, uh, before we go back to the chat questions, ask you something that is burning, uh, uh, burning for me. And that is, you mentioned like, come on, people, there is so much opportunity. We need students, we need graduates, get in. It's an exciting field and a lot, a lot of work to do. But the industry suffers from recruiting students. Geoinformation programs have problems attracting students. What do you say? And it's not like our programs are bad, <laughs> on the contrary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess it's a su supply and demand, you know, problem. I, I promise you have a lot more students now than the graduate school I went to. <laughs> and I remember when I told my father, who was a nuclear scientist, when I told my father I wanted to be a geographer, he threw his hands up in the air like, what are you ever going to do with geography? And, you know, when I was looking for my first uh, job out of graduate school, it was there was no internet. I had to buy the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the only place to get employment was largely with the DOD and the Intel community. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, it always amazes me how many people I run into now that know what GIS stand for. Mm -hmm. um, very few of them really understand remote sensing, but everybody understands, you know, Google Maps and Apple Maps and Zillow and all these embedded applications. Um, I think the field of data scientists, um, you know, blending our geography, our classical geography with our remote sensing and data science and computer science. Um, and I see the schools in so many different departments now. I went to, you know, a classical geography program, uh, but I'm, I'm seeing students and really great students. I love hiring millennials. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, I think the quality of the skill set mm -hmm. um, is really excellent. Okay. So it's basically the diversity and um, uh, uh, skill set that people bring and less the actual study program they come from. Well, I think there's room for all of that. Yeah, but I agree with that. I mean, I still think it's important to understand classical geography. You know, and it's not perhaps not necessary anymore now that everything's automated. <laughs> but um, I think having a strong foundation in, in the fundamentals mm -hmm. is, is still important. But I, I assure you, you know, we hire people from many, many different programs, not just out of geography programs that have wonderful skill sets and know a tremendous amount about remote sensing. OK, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions from the chat. Should I take one and you the next one, Lawrence? Very okay. well. uh, um, there is a question um, that says the following. Innovation uh, oftentimes is led by the military of various countries. What is your assessment of linkages to what you described? Where do you see the discussion going in the next few years? Well, you know, it's interesting. I. I often talk about how the military led the innovation in this field. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I mean, this field was born, the field of remote sensing was born out of the Russian and U.S. military, right? That's mm -hmm. where it first started. And, uh, but, and there's still a tremendous amount of innovation going mm -hmm. on there. But um, I would say the commercial sector uh, in the startup and the venture capital world in particular are the ones that are outpacing the innovation, even of the DOD and the Intel, because they move so much faster. If there's a market there, if there's an idea there, they're going to be much faster to market. Um, and so I, I, I'm sure the DOD, I used to work in that environment. I haven't for more than a decade now, um, but I am sure they're really innovating on you know sensor networks and things of that mm -hmm. nature that are automatically integrated with ai and ml but as far as i'm concerned the civilian applications the humanitarian applications of this technology um there's no lack of innovation occurring okay and the second part of that question was um uh, more related to the sail drones and uh, the question, what is actually the uh, 
uh, con constricting, uh, constructing, constricting factor to the sale drones to be limited to go out for up to 12 months. The limiting factor there is the fouling on the underside of the vessel. They need to be, they need to come out of the water and be cleaned. Mm -hmm. um, and generally after 12 months at sea, many of those sensors need to be cleaned and refurbished as well. But that, that is the limiting factor. And those, those um, sail drones have circumnavigated the Antarctic last summer. Mm -hmm. That's no um, easy task. Uh, and are in the Arctic now and can get right up against the ice sheet where it would be far too dangerous uh, to put a, a human uh, staffed vessel in its place. Far too expensive and far too dangerous. Yeah, great. I also have a question, my personal question, then how do these sail drones not bump into other ships? So they have a tremendous number of uh, navigational technology on board. Um, and so they send and receive AIS signals. They communicate back with the headquarters like every two to three minutes. They have a good bit of machine learning on board. Um, and they have really only lost, I believe, in the last five years, two or three sail drones. Uh, one was in a 60 foot seas. Um, they also have never been tampered with by other vessels. Other vessels will come up and look at them. They are scientific instruments, so they will look at them. They are bright orange on purpose mm -hmm. uh, so that people can see them. Uh, and the Coast Guards around the world seem to be okay with them. So there's never been uh, um, a problem with them running into another vessel. And they sail through some very congested ports. Oh. Interesting. So they do go into into national waters. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. There is a, one more question from the uh, audience, which says, what, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, what are the uh, biggest milestones uh, that uh, Radiant Earth contributes to reaching the sustainable development goals? Yeah. So this is an interesting um, question because it, uh, when I founded Radiant four years ago, at that time, there were no open platforms where people could come in and get open data and in that same environment, analyze the data with open source software. Um, and so the thesis was we were going to build that environment, a cloud-based environment with open source software so that in particular, for instance, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Catholic Relief Services, uh, many of the other um, nonprofits that work in the global development sphere could easily get their hands on the remote sensing data they needed. When we started the development of that, uh, there were no other platforms available. It took us 20 months to bring that product to market and about three and a half million dollars. And by the time we brought it to market, I looked at an environmental scan and there were 12 commercial companies doing the same thing. Uh, and that's not a good place to be spending philanthropic dollars to compete uh, with commercial mm -hmm. entities. Um, I could easily tell you in our old mission, when we had that mission of building that platform, we were working with Catholic Relief Services. We were look, working with World Vision and helping those people on the ground solve sustainable development goal problems on the ground. When I made the pivot to building training data libraries and building a community around open models, it is a back-end infrastructure. Again, a library, think Rockefeller Library, think the Guggenheim Library, mm -hmm. one of the first of its kind, to help spread the knowledge and to speed innovation, lower mm -hmm. cost and speed innovation. So again, our contribution is as an infrastructure to help others do the work. Mm -hmm. So um, with that said, we do still work on some projects. We're doing some work right now with the locust infestation in Africa, and machine learning mm -hmm. uh, there. So we'll still, but again, at the end of the day, our biggest benefit is to help others do this innovation by organizing the data, organizing models and building the community. Thank 
okay i i would wonder if if there is no interest from a big big player to like google facebook whoever um to also well not not only to get this data but also to share this kind of training data because everybody needs it it's the fuel for all of this so how comes nobody does it and you have to do it well, I mean, we've, we're building collaborations with many uh, commercial entities as well as um, academic organizations. As I mentioned, Big EarthNet is out there now. Uh, uh, we work closely with that team. Um, and there are some commercial companies that are interested in, in sharing. Uh, Microsoft AI for Good, we have a, a collaboration with them and they've shared some of their data. Uh, we're in discussions. Uh, with some others around sharing some data that from Sentinel One to map water globally. The commercial companies though, the commercial operators, satellite operators, and I have no problem with this, they have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in building those constellations and developing their own training data that is their intellectual property they are never going to give it away. It is their secret sauce. It's what will drive their revenues. Um, and so we really have to separate the commercial operators, right, from commercial companies that embed geospatial, but that data is not central to their revenue stream, right, mm -hmm. uh, the data itself. So, uh, but, uh, but we've seen a lot of great cooperation from the commercial sector, particularly around building the standards uh, mm -hmm. for discovery, the spatial temporal asset catalog. That would not have been possible without 20 or 30 companies coming together to, um, to fund our meetings, to get the right people in the room um, and to do those, uh, that tech development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, could you go into a little bit? I, I, it's the first time I hear about Stack. Um, uh -huh. uh, can you go a little bit more in detail in what it is and what yes. I could for how? Yeah, how I haven't done any, I haven't done any technical work in like twenty years, so <laughs> this is this is the elevator pitch. Uh, but it, it it's it's very similar to a Google search engine, but for geospatial data, and mm -hmm. it's referencing. Uh, and it's referencing and helping you search across the network any registered data with the right with the right metadata. So it's an asset catalog, spatial temporal asset catalog. It's a search tool. Um, now the data have to be discoverable and formatted in the stack standards, but think of it as a Google search engine specifically for geospatial data. Do we do we have any more questions from the audience? I can only report that uh, your answers and were uh, thankfully acknowledged, and people very much agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I always like that. Uh, maybe just one, just one last question that. Um, uh, I would like to throw in, you mentioned that privacy and ethics in geolocation is a big construction site. Um, would you say that efforts are being made to uh, clean up this field or are we still far away from any useful um, solutions? Well, no, I think, I think the conversations have been gone. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what we need to do as technical experts, perhaps, is engage more regularly with policymakers and the legal community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the policy construct is going to be dependent upon where the data is coming from. Every nation has different laws and regulations. Um, and what I fear is that oftentimes these, uh, the people at the table, Mm -hmm. um, are often the people at the table that have a vested interest, mm -hmm. right? And maybe some of us aren't, you know, we've all got limited bandwidth, but we do have a vested interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, within our communities, within our individual countries, we need to participate in this discussion um, mm -hmm. because it is, it is happening. Um, we see it particularly in training data and they're difficult technical problems and policy problems. Um, there's a, 
World Bank database called LSMS, which is uh, a survey that the World Bank pays for in countries and developing countries around the globe uh, on a regular basis. It is a very expensive and a very thorough uh, um, survey where they actually go out to every individual home and do a census. Who lives here? What's your name? How many people live in this building? What, what are their gender? How many acres or hectares do you farm? Where are the field boundaries? What do you grow in these boundaries? How much money do you make? Um, that data set is super invaluable for remote sensing of agriculture. If we've got those field boundaries and we know what's growing in those fields and we can train on that. But we don't want anybody's name. We don't want anybody's gender. We don't want anybody's cell phone. Um, and on and on and on. Uh, and so we have to be able to work with the policymakers at the World Bank, with the countries where the data were collected, and develop these best practices mm -hmm. uh, for uh, how to use this data in the future or not use it. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, one last question um, before we maybe uh, wrap up. Um, could you point? A point me, the, the, the question person, to the right direction where to find the data set of uh, the example in Mozambique you have mentioned. So if you, um, Mark, if you go up to a post to above that, um, I, but actually my, uh, my uh, colleague Louisa posted under my name <laughs> a comment. Um, where you can find Radiant ML Hub, the registry, and you'll find the Mozambique data in there. Okay. Good. Okay. That's it. I think the Go Mozambique ahead. data was about the the Gates Foundation, which was the oh 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 um, footprints of entire Africa, um, which you said were available for humanitarian use. Of course, that would be super interesting. Oh, that. Um, yeah, I can, Mark, if you uh, send me an email, which is Anne, A-N-N-E, at radiant.earth, um, we can have that conversation. Okay. Good. In that case, um, I would think that we, we can wrap up. There are no more questions. Under normal circumstances, Anne, this wouldn't be just virtual. It would be real. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a uh, very special agate wine, which I hope next year in person, I will be able to hand it over to you and uh, we can um, uh, toast to um, a, a really great talk, excellent time and wonderful insight into a highly um, hot topic uh, for our discipline. Thank oh, you thank very you. much. Thank you, Adrian. And I, I, I look forward to receiving that bottle from you next year. I'll hold you to it. Absolutely. So let's hope we can see uh, each other in Salzburg next year. Okay. Nice to meet you, Lorenz. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for your talk.